All right, let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father, we are now going to start our last in this lecture series. We've come a long way. We've journeyed together. We are so thankful for the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit and how gracious you have been to provide us with this information. And we ask that today, as we talk about possibly, if not the most important, at least one of the most important tenets in the plan of salvation, and that is what happens to those that turn down your gracious offer, that you will be with us and enlighten our minds yet again. Amen. Uh, recording this one. Yeah. We're, we're, re- yep, we're recording. It's right here. Okay, the end of sin and sinners. But as you recall, we had a little bit of leftover work from last time, so we're going to go over the review real quickly. Grace is the part that God plays in editing and rewriting our code to eliminate any traces of the devil's handiwork, and in so doing, making us impervious to the devil's advances, i.e., his temptations. Faith is the part that we must play to allow God to have full access to our information system so that he can institute grace on our behalf. Remember I had the the refueling uh, jet, uh, the mother jet, with the, um, the connections going down to the jet fighters to refuel them? That's, that's, that is faith. From the, the grace is located in that big refueling mothership, and she and grace is being deleted. I mean, being uh, sent down to the two fighters that were under each wing. Sanctification is the final result of grace and faith working together in an individual to remove any of the devil's code and replace the original information which has been lost. So what this we're talking about is an information system that was grossly hijacked, which has to be put back in its original condition, actually not original condition, even in better condition. Justification says that we are fit for heaven because we have been sanctified. God is just or right. The ikonosea the, the, is the Greek word. Just and right or righteous, righteousness and, just, and, and justice all come translated from that single word. God is just in welcoming us into his heavenly courts because our genome is perfectly compatible with life there. Therefore, we belong there. We don't belong here. God provides the know-how, the power, guarantees not to overwhelm us, directs the Holy Spirit in the process, and is able to correct any genome, no matter how degraded, and will finish the job of sanctification if we only put our faith, our cooperation with him. In other words, if we'll stay the course, he guarantees the results. However, cooperating with the sanctification process requires that we remain under. Remember we talked about, and we're going to go back again today and review it a little further detail. Even when temptations and trials specially suited to aid in God's rewriting process befall us. Remember, we, the system has to be stressed so that the different parts of the genome are opened up and the code is, re, is, is now open for business. It can either be corrected, which is the uh, purpose of these trials and temptations, but it's also fair game. The devil has equal access and he can actually come in and if we choose, we can make the matter worse because we can join him in his suggestions. Then said Jesus to the disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Staying under can be very difficult at times, especially when we can't see through to the future. We can't understand why we're being led in the way we are. And of course the temptation is there. God's not leading you. He's abandoned you. Or he's actually not, doesn't have your best interest in mind. Get out while you can. And of course a perfect example of that would be Abraham when he was told to sacrifice Isaac. All the way to the trip, on the way to Mount Moriah, the devil was there telling Abraham... Stop. Go back. You're crazy. God wouldn't have asked you to do this. 
Are we expected to do something in our salvation? Remember, number one was remain under, which we completed in our last lecture, so we, that topic. Two, which we're going to pick up today, is keep the Sabbath. And three, is to tell others. So it's pretty straightforward. We have to remain under, that means faith meets grace, and we are undergoing a rewrite of our information system. But there's two other things that aid and help in that process. The first is keep the Sabbath, and the other is we need to tell others. And we'll discuss those briefly. Why is the Sabbath a special day? Uh, repeatedly in the past, I've heard people say, well, it doesn't really matter which day. In fact, it doesn't. you don't really have to do a day. I'm always talking with God. It doesn't, this idea of setting aside a special day is just so much cultural... Um, old cultural uh, ideas and habits from the Bible. We know God's omnipotent. He's not limited by time. And therefore, trying to make one day a better over, over the others as far as communicating with God is foolishness. That is a very, very unsustainable and a very dangerous position to take because the Bible says exactly the opposite. To you first, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Okay, what was Christ's number one blessing? The main reason he was sent was to turn us away from our iniquities. And in the past, we've already discussed and defined iniquities as being mobile genetic elements. In, is when you're looking at it from a genome perspective. So that's Christ's job one. That's his job one when he comes. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in that he had rested from his work which God created and had made. Now notice this is in Genesis 2-3 and that this Sabbath issue occurred before the fall. So the Sabbath is not a sin, it's not a solely sin related exercise. It was put in place prior to sin ever having entered. That's a very important point because a lot of times people like to say, well, the Seventh-day Sabbath is, is um, antiquated. It only ref applies to the Old Testament. Uh, no, actually, the Seventh-day Sabbath was the way things were going to be had Adam and Eve not sinned. It was the original equipment. And in a little bit here, we'll discuss what might have been the reason and why in Isaiah 66 we're told that the redeemed will go every seven days on Sabbath to the New Jerusalem and will be keeping Sabbath again. And I can tell you as a young boy when that, when that message was drilled home to me, I was absolutely despondent. I thought I have put up with all of these Sabbaths down here and it's going to be there for eternity. I give up. Because I was under the, um, back in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of checklists about what you could do on Sabbath and what you couldn't do. For instance, if you were out at the river on an 8th grade ski trip, which I was, and Sabbath came and the temperature was 115, the rules were you could only wander out into the Colorado River up to your knees. If you wandered further than that, that would be considered swimming. Okay? That was just giving you a little bit of the idea. Unfortunately, well-meaning people did a lot of serious damage. God blessed the seventh day. When it, if you look up the Hebrew word for blessed, what it really means is the, that word is giving honor to, someone bowing before something and is giving it honor. Now, obviously, God's not bowing before the day, but it's giving the Hebrews the idea that this is a big deal. God has set this aside. It's not a minor issue. It's a really big deal. Because if God is going, this is important, that means we had better take a, uh, careful attention to it. Then it says he sanctified it. That is the word that they used to do. The process where they would take the utensils that were going to be put into the sanctuary before they were put into the sanctuary, they were sanctified. That means they are set aside for some very important religious purpose. Very important religious purpose. Okay, what could... Now let's put this together. Well, well 
how is this going to affect a day? We can understand if it's candle, seven candlesticks, but what are we talking about in a day? Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. What, the, what, God is, what Christ is saying here in Ezekiel is, I'm going to prove to you that I, it is me that does the sanctifying and as evidence, as exhibit A, I'm going to point out to you the Sabbath. That's what I'm pointing to as my proof. Why? Because that's when I do my sanctifying. How could that be his proof for something unless that's the time in which he's doing it? Now, I believe that God can sanctify us on all six days, but let's put this other six other days too, but let's put this together. Remember what it says up here in Genesis? That God rested from the work that he had done? Now, does that mean that God stops doing everything? No, because... Gravity would cease and we would fly all over the place. The first, uh, the three laws of thermodynamics would no longer operate, and we would not have uh, energy to even be here today. We would have no lights. Um, so it doesn't mean that he's stopping everything he's doing. It just means that he's stopping something that is not delineated. That is not, we are not given further information, but some of the things that he has done, yet to be identified, he stops doing. Why? Because he is going, he takes, uh, the, that enables him to do something for us special on that day. He, God is going to the point to tell us, I am actually going to curtail some of my other activities that I do on the other six days because I need to have more resources to do something for you on this day. Which also means if you choose not to meet him on that day, you're out of luck. You remember my discussion of a, of a bricks truck, and if I offered you on Monday to give all of you $10,000, if you show up right out here between 9 and 10 o'clock, and someone shows up on Tuesday and says, well, Monday was inconvenient, and I knew you had the money, so I just showed up on Tuesday and I said, yeah, but the Brinks truck with the money was here yesterday and it's not today. I do have the money. But the means that I have instituted to deliver it to you aren't functioning today. And I told you that when I told you to be here on Monday morning between 9 and 10. So, this is a big deal. Something is very important. Now, what could have it been the reason why God would have instituted a Sabbath prior to sin? The Bible doesn't tell us, but I can tell you after countless hours reading genetic material and information transfer and all the stuff that goes with it that Dr. Webster and I, uh, you know, we just love that sort of stuff, that it is apparent to me that what was needed prior to the fall was that every seven days we needed to get an information download. A lot of stuff happens in the universe in seven days. And that, therefore, God set it up us on a physiological cycle so that, remember, we were talked about this in the lecture on the Ten Commandments, so that on the seventh day we are physiologically the most primed to receive the downloads, at least that's the hypothesis that I presented. We are the most physiologically ready to receive the downloads, and that's when he has gone to all the work and trouble to, to arrange his resources to deliver them. And prior to the fall, and after everything is reinstituted the way it's supposed to be, we're still going to need information downloads on a weekly basis. It's just now that sin is here, it's triply, quadruply, ten times exponentially more important because prior to the fall we had normal information systems or correctly operating information systems and now we have severely defective information systems. So not only does he have to give us the downloads you normally would give us, he's got to correct the, the problem, correct the damage done. And that's why at the very end of time, an issue is going to be made about whether or not you are supposed to keep the Saturday. 
Because if you don't get the downloads, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, the latter rain, that's when the, la- the I believe the, the bulk of that work is going to be done. If you're not there to receive it, you don't get it, you're not going to make it. And Constantine was the first one around 330 A.D. to make the first Sunday law, which said that not only did you have to honor the vulnerable, vulnerable, venerable day of the sun, but you were forbidden to uh, worship on Saturday. You had to treat it like any of the other six days. So that's the first true Sunday law. You have to keep Sunday as, as your Sabbath, and you must work on Saturday. Isaiah says here, <coughs> excuse me, that if you, you're not to do your own pleasure on that day, and if you don't do your own pleasure on that day, great blessings are being promised. Okay, now what does he mean by that? Do you remember this slide from the dieters, which we talked about a number of lectures ago? Remember there was two sets of dieters. Uh, a group of dieters were brought in, were recruited for an experiment, and they were randomly put into two groups, a control group and an experimental group. And in the control group, they were told to remember two digits, two numbers. And in the experimental group, they were told to remember seven numbers. And what they were told was that they were going to be allowed to sit in this room for an hour. The experimenters would come in and give them their numbers on a slip of paper, and then they were to hand the slip of paper back, and they had no writing utensils, and they were to sit there for an hour, and then the experimenters were going to come back and ask them to write down the number they had been asked to memorize. Now, as soon as the experimenters were able to inform everyone confidentially what their numbers were, they left the room and they said, while we're waiting for this hour, we thought you might be hungry. And so they brought in some trays of salad and some trays of chocolate cake. And they said, feel free to help yourself if you'd like. Well, obviously, this was the real experiment. The the, uh, subjects thought, okay, we've got to remember these numbers. And some of them, uh, and what they found was they carefully chronicalized which, what the subjects took. Did they take the salad or did they take the chocolate cake? And what they found was the people who had been asked to memorize seven numbers, 50% more of them chose chocolate cake. Then the group that had been asked to memorize only two numbers, the majority of those took salad. Now see, they're dieters, so immediately the chocolate cake is going to be off limits for all of them. And so the paper goes on to explain that our minds have bandwidth. And if we are using the bandwidth on, in this case, the dieters were busy trying on the seven digits, they were trying to remember the seven digits. They were going over it and over it and over it again. It took enough of their frontal and prefrontal cortex computing ability that, the, that it was hampered in sending a message down to the amygdala, no, you're not going to have chocolate cake, because the amygdala and the hippocampus areas, the limbic system always is for self-gratification, and immediately it sends up a message, let's go for the cake. And it's the prefrontal and the frontal cortex that say, no, you're not going for the cake, we are stepping in and we are vetoing your request. But when it is busy trying to remember seven numbers, it's less effective at vetoing the desire to eat the cake. So let's apply this. If you and I on Sabbath are busy figuring out how we're going to balance our checkbook, where we're going to go on vacation, what should we do about the backyard? Do we want to fix the swimming pool? It's the same to us as the the group of dieters who are memorizing seven digits. We only have so much bandwidth. And therefore, there is no little or no bandwidth left for God to come in and do his information download. 
See why it's so important? Why did Nehemiah say there's 150 feet approximately all around the Jerusalem that was called holy ground on Sabbath? The merchants couldn't come because even though they closed the gates, the merchants would come by the, the, the city walls and the Jews would be on top of the walls and they'd continue their bartering. This is a bandwidth issue. And it's vitally important because guess what? The problem we're dealing with is an information problem. And so doesn't it make sense that the correction would be an information correction? And if the primary day on which that correction is going to occur, if your bandwidth is absolutely locked up doing things down here, you can't get the download. You miss out. And if you miss out, later in this lecture, we're going to find out it's not a good thing. So, then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Sabbath comes, and you're not listening, and you're not listening to the word of God, whether it's him talking to you as you're reading the Bible, or going to hear a, a sermon, or reading a periodical or going out in nature and, and seeing his handiwork there. There's many ways he can speak to you. There's many ways in which the word of God can come to you. But if your bandwidth is entirely you being used on daily mundane things pertaining just to this world, you're going to miss out. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave, her, gave herself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse with the washing of water by the word. The information that the Holy Spirit brings and is utilized at a biological level in our nucleuses of our cells is what cleanses us. And if you're not there to receive it, you're going to miss out. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. This stuff, we've got to have rewrites being done. We need to have rewrites every week. The special day for that rewrite is the day that God sanctified and says, I'm going to curtail some of my other activities so that I can do that. It's that important. It's by the word of God that we're born again. And that's how the rewrites occur. Now, moving on to telling others. Go, there, go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and see, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. I brought this point up, I think, in the very first lecture, and I'm going to bring it up again briefly. Don't you think God would be much more successful if he ran the evangelistic program himself? I do. I've been to some evangelistic programs that's made me cringe. Don't you think if we took the middlemen out, come and give us a straight word yourself. And hey, if you could throw in just one or two miracles, <clears throat> we would have the whole world in a, just a matter of hours now that we've got the internet. And look at us here, we're laboring away, trying to... I, the unfortunate truth is, more children now are being born every hour than people are being contacted about God. I hate to tell you that. We are losing in this endeavor if we're looking simply at numbers. Why would God pick something so... a system that's so inefficient? <clears throat> That's not like God. If you look at all the systems that he has in our bio biology and our cells, they're extremely efficient. They're marvelously put together. This seems to be a glaring problem. And if we look around, we would have to say, just with the information we've had so far, that's not working very well. In fact, if we had to grade it D minus, we don't like to say uh, uh, an F grade, do we? We're no C, and forget anything above that. 
why would God institute a system that apparently is not working? Well, about six months ago, I read an article in the New York Times. It was very interesting. A, a psychologist who happens to be an avowed atheist decided to go and find out why it was that Alcoholics Anonymous, at least in their printed materials, appeared to be head and shoulders above any other program to deal with alcohol addiction. And he decided to go in and take a very close look because of course being an atheist he says this idea that you're going to have a, a power outside of yourself is just so much bunk. That can't be the right answer. There's got to be another reason why they, they seem to have a better statistical number. And so he went and looked it through and he came, he, he, he came out with his findings. And his findings were number one, yes they are statistically better than any other detox program for alcohol around, but they're not as successful as they claim they are, but they're not as, they are not further as far ahead of the pack as they claim they are, but they are ahead of the pack. But he says after carefully looking through their program, his take why they were more, why uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is more successful was due to the fact that as soon as someone joined a certain, uh, their, the group in their city, after they'd been there about two or three months, they were assigned the next new member that came in. And they were to serve as a mentor to tell them what they had gone through in the, last, in the first three months of being part of Alcohol Anonymous and to tell them what they're going to be up against, what the problems and pitfalls and where they're most likely to recidivize. And sometimes these mentoring processes would go on for years. They would, they would become close friends. None of the other detox programs use that, that scenario. And what he came up with the conclusion was that it was far more beneficial to the person doing the mentoring than to the person who was being mentored. Now, they both, they both got a very positive response from this setup. But the person who was doing the mentoring got by far the greatest strength and help and uh, was the best single best predictor whether they would recidivize or not is if they were actively mentoring another Alcoholics Anonymous member. I'm going to tell you because we don't have enough time I'm just going to tell you that there is a plenty of evidence that the person who does the witnessing gets the better part of the deal and something happens to you inside because now the Holy Spirit can come and say I want you to talk to so and so and in talking to you and coming into you you get something you wouldn't have got otherwise and I'm going to suggest to you that it was absolutely necessary for our salvation otherwise I think God would have said I'll, I'll skip the middleman and I'll do it myself it's because of us He's willing to take this great inefficiency and I might say, if you watch some of the televangelists on Sundays, people going out and saying some horrendous things about him. It's got to be awfully important to put up with all of that. And I want to tell you it is because there is not going to be anyone in heaven, in my opinion, who hasn't told somebody else and that person is there at least partially because of the effort expended by person number one. No one's going to arrive there and not have told anybody. Now, a few other little other housekeeping things and then we're done with the part we have to play with sanctification. Only the creator of the information system can repair and rewrite the code. In John 1, 1 to 3 it says, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Okay, that tells us the person who wrote our code, our information system was Christ. It wasn't God the Father and we don't know whether he, God the Father could have or not, but he, it wasn't him and it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was Christ. Now I've been in a many a Sabbath school where the people start talking about, uh, well... We can't stand this text. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven a given among men whereby we must be saved. And they start trashing this, and they say that's just egocentric. 
we're just being egocentric. There, they are, there it is, the white man again, trying to dictate to others what they should think and believe. And the argument goes like this, well, Muslims are going to be in heaven, isn't there? People in Africa who've never heard of Christ's name is going to be in, in heaven, aren't they? There's many different paths to heaven. Christ isn't the only path. But that argument is extremely fallacious. Because that argument, they're mixing two arguments. We're not discussing here, can you be in heaven if you are a Muslim and you've never heard about Christ? Or can you be in heaven if you grew up in Africa at a point in time when, in 300 years ago when there was no missionary there and you never heard of Christ? That's not the question we're talking about. That's not the point that we're discussing. The point that we're discussing is, if you're in heaven, you're, you're there for one reason only, and that's because the original code writer rewrote your code. And there is nobody else who can rewrite your code full stop. Muhammad can't. Buddha can't. Confucius can't. The Hindu, uh, uh, the Hindu gods cannot. Only Christ can rewrite it. And whatever name you want to put on him, he's the only one that can rewrite your code. And if he doesn't write, rewrite your code, you're not going to be in heaven. That's the point. And now if you want to discuss, can people be saved who have never heard of Christ's name, go read Romans 2. And Paul talks about that in length. Yes, you can. But it's Christ doing the rewrite, and he is responsible for them being in heaven. Period. When does this sanctification occur? Here's another little thing we need to clean up. I've heard many a time, well, all of this... Uh, Victorian ideas that we have to work, uh, they use the word work, on our salvation is uh, just uh, problematic and emblematic of the times. We know differently now. And of course, Ephesians 2.8 is put out, you know, we are no longer under works, under the law, but under grace, so that no man can brag that he has been saved. And the idea is this, and then they quote 1 Corinthians 15, 52, which says that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're all going to be changed. And they say, see, that's when we're sanctified. All the work that you may or may not do now is immaterial. When we come to that point in time, when Christ comes the second time, we're all changed in an instant. Or if you have died and you're resurrected, that's when you're changed. That's when all your bad habits disappear. The trouble with that argument is this. It doesn't say what is changed. It just says we will be changed. It doesn't say our minds will be changed. In fact, if you read Romans 12, 1 to 3, as well as a number of other texts, the changing of our mind has to occur prior to our death and or prior to his coming, or it doesn't happen at all. So there it means a different change must have a, must be talked about here in 1 Corinthians 15.52. Now, it's never delineated exactly what that change is. So anyone is free to say, well, I think he's going to completely rechange your mind. And someone else like myself can say, no, I think it's something else. I think what's being changed is that 40% or so of the mobile genetic elements that were tied up as soon as Adam and Eve came out of the garden. And, and, and Genesis 3.15 says, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and my seed. That 40% that or so that's always been locked up, but if it's ever let to be unlocked, you kills the organism. I think that's what's going to be changed and removed. It's always been out of the picture anyway. And it's been lurking there as a time bomb. I can't prove that. But I, and neither can the person who says, well, it's our mind that's changed. They can't prove it either. It has been left vague, and I suspect on purpose. Well, what does the Bible say? When is this change supposed to take place? It says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly because we're going to be changed at the last instant when the trump ha comes. Oh no, it doesn't say that. It says in this present world, right now. This isn't something that's uh, uh, the tidying up that's going to occur when he comes or as, when we're resurrected. 
This is to occur now. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the middle of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in this world. We're to be so different that we stand out. And you can't stand out if you're not having your code rewritten. You're going to look like everybody else. You're going to act like everybody else. And I, this is the text that I would say to the people who go, oh, no, 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 there he is again. He's, he's, he's talking works. Remember, we talked earlier in one of the lectures, that if you really press these people, it's really effort that they're talking about. You're having to put forth effort, and that's not part of the gospel. I've already covered this earlier, and I'm not going to recover it again. But if someone says to you, oh no, you don't have to change. God's going to do it for you at the very end. In the last instance, I'm going to say to you that that person is having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We have power right now to change. We have power. He's given us power right now to change. He, what does he say in John 1? That he gave them the power to become the sons of God. We've talked about what it means to be a son of God. I'm not going to go over that again, but you know what has to do with genome. He came to give us the power to become the sons of God. He didn't come to say, I'm going to do the work for you at the very last instant. I'm going to empower you, and you and I are going to work together, and we're going to rewrite your information system. And what happens? We get a new information system. His seed remains us, and we cannot sin. Remember, sin is the unauthorized addition or subtraction from the information system. And what does that? Mobile genetic elements. So another way we could say that, if we wanted to, if we use the genome hypothesis, is whoever is born of God does not use any active MGEs anymore. Does not have any MGEs activated in his system. Because they have to be present for the addition or the subtraction the, uh, of uh, code that we're talking about, which would be sin. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The bad code that was written has been completely erased and new code has been placed in its place. This does not mean that we will never make a mistake because we will still have defective hardware and software. What it does mean is that we will no longer listen, much, live, get, much less give thought to the evil one when he comes to seduce us. This will be the case for the 144 spoken of in Revelation 14. Those are the ones that don't see death. When Christ comes the second time, they are translated. Due to time issues, we can't go further into this today, although I would love to. And finally, we will become one, my little children, of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you. Well, if Christ is formed in all of us, guess what? That's how we're going to know we're, we're disciples, because... We're going to love one another. Why do we love one another? Because we are all coming into... We are all... Christ is being formed in all of us. And birds of a feather flock together. We're going to naturally seek out people who are on the same rewrite pathway that we are. It just makes sense. That they, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and that also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Now what he's saying here is that we're not all robots and automatons saying and thinking the same thing. It just means we're in one accord. At one month. The word atonement really means at one month. We're at one month in the way that we approach life. With the rewritten code, God's fathers will think and behave like their author. That is why they will naturally congregate together and form his church. Notice that the church is being formed because we are being changed and we naturally congregate together. It's not being formed because someone sits down and writes a creed and says, you better believe this and if you don't, you're not a member and if you do, we'll let you in. If things are working correctly, and I, I'm just going to drop this little stink bomb and move on. If things are working correctly, I would assert to you, and some other time we can discuss this, 
But you don't need a creed. What happens to the people who turn God down on his gracious offer? Okay, we're done now with with the sanctification process. Let's flip the side. We've been talking about those who do take God up on his offer of sanctification and of salvation. What about those who don't? And the Bible tells us in Matthew 7 that there's the majority are in this, this group that we're going to talk about now. The don't people. Does God eternally burn them? Most religions today, I'd say 98% plus, would say yes to that. Do they die? Well, um, that depends on who you talk to. If you talk to those of us at Seventh-day Adventist Church, we're very quick to say, oh no. The others have an eternal lasting hell where you burn forever. But our God is much more gracious. He only burns you as long as you deserve. Can't you hear the sigh of relief when you tell that to people? Oh, that's so much better. Oh, man, thank you. That's ridiculous. The primary issue here is that a God would burn you. What parent do you know of that would burn their children if they refused to listen to them? Don't we have child protective agencies that would remove them? And, but if we say, oh, don't worry. They don't constantly burn them. They just burn them enough until they've decided that they've had enough and then they don't do it anymore. Do you think the child protective agency would go, oh, okay, well, that's fine. That, I guess that's just correction. Are we better parents than God as parents of his own children? Could God learn something from our child protective agency laws? <clears throat> and how do they die? We know they die. That we're, to, we're told repeatedly that they die. We've already talked about the first death, and we're going to talk about the second death today. Let me point something out to you. If we take the premise, and we just for stipulate for this argument, that God does burn them, okay? Because people who take the other view say, who are you to say the Bible says he burns it? And if the Bible says it, that's the way it is, and don't ask any questions. So let's go with that for just a moment, shall we? Okay. So God's going to burn the people. And you say, why is he going to burn the people? For punishment. They turned him down. They turned down his loving, gracious offer. Okay, well, if we go to Webster and we look it up, we say, okay, now let's get this straight. He's going to burn them. And this, and, and for those of you who believe forever, that means forever. They never get let out. They don't get time out for good behavior. There's not a point in time when they say, okay, you've burned enough. No, no, it's forever. So they lived here for 25 years. They didn't do things right. They admit it. They're going to get 20. They, they, they don't get 10 years to life like we give in our system. They get eternity. Yep, yep, yep. Or if the people, the others who say, oh no, he's a much more gracious God. He limits the amount of time you burn. They would say, oh no, yeah, he, he, he kills them then. Because you ask, how do they die? Well, he, he, he kills them in, in his righteous anger in his wrath, and they'll give you the text. And I don't have time to go through this today. It's a very interesting exercise, and I would love to have done it, but I can't. I'm just trying to make a simple point here, and then we're going to move on. Okay, if I take somebody, first of all, if I keep them burning constantly, guess what happens? All of their uh, nerve endings disintegrate. So they get third-degree burns, and the hallmark of a third-degree burn is it doesn't hurt anymore. So when you bring that up, they go, well, then God regenerates the nerves so they can continue to feel it. Well, this picture is getting better all the time. I'm, I'm, now I'm coming over to your side. This is really a God I would like to, to get to know better. But then the question comes here. And you say, why are they doing this for punishment? Well, but if you go look up punishment in Webster's Dictionary, it says that it's a noxious stimulus that's applied to correct behavior. And it's applied with the purpose of training the individual so they won't do that behavior again. 
but you've just said they're here forever. It doesn't matter if they say, all right, I'm done. I won't ever do it again. It's too late. Forever you're going to be burned. Or if you're in the camp that says that, that, you're going, that, they, that they die, it's only for a certain period of time, they get tortured up to that point and then they're killed. That's torture. That's not punishment. Torture is defined as providing a noxious stimulus to someone for the sole purpose of applying this, for applying for, for, for causing pain. No other reason. If you're going to be killed right after you're burned, it can't be punishment because there's no chance for you to correct your behavior. It's not for correction of behavior. It's to cause you to suffer. And if you're going to suffer forever, we got the same problem because you don't get let out. So now what we have is, here's the good news, folks. We've got a God that tortures. And let's not sugarcoat it. That's exactly what this is. It's torture. Go look up. Go look it up in Webster. See if I'm right. George Carlin put it this way. Religion has convinced people that there's an invisible man living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day. And the invisible man has a list of ten specific things he doesn't want you to do. And if you do any of these things, he will send you to a special place of burning and fire and smoke and torture and anguish for you to live in forever. And sulfur and sulfur and burn and scream until the end of time. But he loves you. He loves you. He loves you and he needs your money. <laughs> I can't find anything to fault that statement with because it's all factual if you go talk to the people who are presenting the other side. They don't like the way you've put the words together. Absolutely. And they will become incensed at it. But when you press them, they have no comeback argument. Is this good news? Is this something that you really want to go to your next door neighbor and say, I've got great news. God doesn't burn you forever. He just burns you for as long as you deserve. I don't want a God who burns his children to cause them pain because he wouldn't join them. Let's, now let's, so let's start. Let's look at this carefully. Let's go to judgment. Creases. It, it means a separating, a sundering, or a separation. We always think of judgment as God sitting up there and the books are opened and a name comes up, John Doe, and he goes, oh yeah, John Doe, what's, what's he been doing? Oh my word, I didn't know he was doing that. Oh, this is terrible. What are we going to do? And Christ is right there next to him going, oh please, I know John. John's a good guy. Now, yeah, he's had some problems recently, but come on, can't we let him in? I mean, look what I did for John. And God the Father goes, oh boy, I don't know. This is really distressing me. In fact, I'm getting a little upset as I look at this. And Christ goes, no, 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 please don't. I'll take him personally. I'll... Come on. The intelligences that created this universe and were able to create human bodies are going to c carry on like this about you and me? It's a separating. It's not one side trying to talk. It's not two people supposedly on the same team trying to talk each other into something. And as it is appointed to men once to die, but after this the judgment. So after we die, or those who are translated, there will be a separating. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. In John, the Gospel of John, chapter 12, Christ says, all judgment's been given to me. And here in Corinthians, Paul says, yeah, Christ does the judging. So we have to, then we have to ask, okay, we have to go and see what does Christ say about the judgment. If he's the guy, if he's the person in charge of this, we need to find out what's going on, and this is the first stop. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. Oh, he says, I judge him not. I thought he was the judge. Oh, my. 
Uh, For I come not to judge the world. Whoa, just a minute. You were just said a moment ago that you were the judge. You, You said it in John 12, and then you just mentioned it in... Paul mentions it in 2 Corinthians. What's going on here? He says, I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. Oh, okay, finally we're getting to who's going to be doing the judges. And he says, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Remember, we talked in the first lecture about the word and reality. The word is reality. What's reality? That which is. And if you go read Psalms 33, Verses 6 through 8, it will tell you that something uh, to this order that he, that he stated and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast by the word of the Lord with the heavens made. So what Christ is saying here is reality is going to be your judge. The things that have been set up, the rules in the, of the universe and the things, the way which everything has occurred, that's what's going to end up judging you or separating you separating the group. This should be, for some of you, at least a small paradigm shift. Because I certainly grew up with the other trembling, hoping when my name came up that I had, at that moment of time, every sin forgiven. And I had even thought that maybe the best thing to do in my little mind, and we can all describe how um, well, we can all have a discussion about uh, my imagination at another time, but I thought maybe the best thing to do would be to, to get all my sins forgiven and then run out in front of a car because that would get me in. I wouldn't have had time to do something else wrong. All the things would be taken care of. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And he said, you you cannot see my face, for there is no man that can see me and live. Hmm. Why? Because our God is a consuming fire. And to give you who are troubled rest with us, and when the Lord, as Jesus revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Now the word destruction there means you go, you cease being. So the people who say you live forever now have got some problems with, with a number of texts that we could look at, but that's not our prime objective today. I'm just throwing that in as a side. From, uh, they shall be punished with everlasting destruct, destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So the way things are, we now are getting this definite message that we've got a problem. We cannot be in God's presence in our sinful state and survive. So let's go with this. Let's let's, let's mature it further. God is a consuming fire. What does this have to do with judgment? Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. The dividing, I'm now, I'm getting the idea here, hey, wait a minute, maybe the dividing is God's glory. Maybe that's what divides the sheep and the goats. And God's glory is the power that runs the universe. So you can't have the universe without God's glory. They're incompatible. That's the light that we're going to talk about here in a minute. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and that men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are worked of God. Okay, what this is telling me is, at some point in time, God's going to reveal himself with his glory. And those that have... We're using genome talk now. Those who have had a 
information system rewrite are going to be drawn toward him. They're going to say, this is the one we've waited for, as stated in Isaiah 25. And the groups that have not had an information rewrite are going to say, no, get us away from this light. We can't stand to be in it. Help us. We want away from this. What is the light that Christ is referring to? Who only has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach to, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. 1 Timothy 6.16 That seems to nail it, for me at least. That's very clear. Do we have any evidence what's going to happen? Well, when Christ comes the second time, remember the first time was in Bethlehem, the second time we've been looking for with rapt attention and uh, are expecting to be in the not distant, too distant future, it points out that the uh, when he comes, those who have not had, I'm using genome talk, a a information system rewrite will hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and say to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of the wrath is coming who, should, who will be able to stand and then in Isaiah there will be another group that at the same time this, this thing is happening the other group will say and it shall be said in that day see this is our God we have waited for him and he will save us This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice that he's here. Markedly 180 degree difference when Christ comes the second time. Why do the two groups react so differently at Christ's second coming? Christ says, I counsel you. This is the, the, uh, uh, the advice given to the Laodicean church, the seventh church in Revelation 3, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. And he talks about white, white raiment. Well, in right, white raiment we know if we look at um, uh, Revelation 19.8 that it's character and, and that uh, you know you're, cover up your nakedness and anoint your eyes with eye salve so you can see. But what is this gold? Well, I'm going to suggest to you and we've already talked about this, and I don't have time to talk about it today, because we've got to make the end zone. We can't just stop in the red zone. We've got to score today. We've got to get all the way done. So I'm going to suggest to you, and I've talked about this before, that in this case, gold is used as a metaphor, and that is for good code. And when he says, buy of me gold tried in the fire, what would he be referring to? Well, let me remind you. We already went through this, what Christ did on this earth, and so I'm not going to go through it again where it talks about how that he says in um, John 17 that he sanctified himself so that he could sanctify us. So if, if that's the case, if he, is, if he has rewritten the code when he was down here, he set the standard of how it was going to be done and how he was going to do it, and then as we talked about on the cross, he established how he was going to remove all the stuff the devil had put in there and still keep you and me, you and me, that this gold tried in the fire occurred when he was resurrected. What was the fire? God's glory. How did that happen? When that bright angel came down from heaven like a thunderbolt and came to the front of his tomb and said, Son of man, Son of God, your Father calls you. And Christ came out and bathed. The the glory of God was around that angel so much so that it blew 300 Roman soldiers down on the ground as if they were dead. But Christ walked out in it. And the fact that he walked out in it proves unmistakably that the rewrite worked. And I will will give you the evidence of why I think that's a correct um, understanding of that event as we get to the very end of this talk. You'll see it becomes very apparent. So just hold that in abeyance until we get to the very end. But who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire. And like fuller's soap. You know what fuller's soap is? I 
it's very alkaline and it strips everything that all the dirt out of the clothes and the color too <laughs> but I mean it's very uh, it's, it's fuller soap is about as strong as you can get for removing dirt uh, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in his righteousness we don't have time to talk about how you make gold pure but you know it co- you have to heat it up to a very high temperature and, and burn off or separate off the impurities right and here in Malachi we're told this is how the sanctifying process is working. For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yes, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. All right? Catching this? Now you, I'm going to point out stubble is dead straw. It's the hulk, hulk the, the, um, the leftover. It's dead. So if we're looking at this as a metaphor, which I think it is, that's something that you should look at carefully. And that the day of comes shall burn them up, said the Lord of hosts. Notice, burns them up. Good, this is a good text for those who say that we don't burn forever, we just burn for a specific period of time. Said the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. They're gone. They're incinerated. You can't even find any evidence that they've been around. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he shall reward every man according to his works. Here's that word glory again. Remember we talked about it in 1 Timothy 6. It's that light around God which no one can go into. Remember when uh, Moses was... Um, I, I'm, I think I've got a text coming up here. I'm going to see if that's true. Two groups of human beings. Why does God's glory affect each group in contrary ways? Well, mobile genetic elements is where, of course, we're going to go. This is what we've been talking about for 13. Well, this is the 13th time. It shouldn't come as a shock that that's where we're going to end up. But I want to point out to you that, remember, um, when Moses wanted to see God in Exodus, it's it's described in uh, Exodus 33 and 34, and he says, can I look and see you? And God, Christ said, no, you can't look me in the face. No man can look me in the face and live. So I'm going to put you here in this little A clove and I'm going to walk by and you can see my backside as I walk by. But as he walked by, he started talking about his character, long-suffering, truthful, honest, righteous, to let Moses know that the way he looked with all the power thereto entrained wasn't where the real money was, and that's in quotes. It was in who he was. Because he could have all that power and be a despot, and in which case, this would be a very, very bad thing. Ask a, one of the Jews in the concentration camps at Dachau if you if they would like eternal life, but the only proviso would be they'd have to live in Dachau for the rest of their life. Do you think any one of them would take you up on it? No, they'd run for those electric fences so fast you, your head would spin. And he said to them. Why call you me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. We've already talked about this. If you look at this Matthew 16 verse, what have we been talking about? We've been talking about locking up mobile genetic elements, haven't we? trying to get them put off in the heterochromatin, remember that? So they can sit out in the nucleus, but they're no, they're taken offline. They're not actively in the process of the cell anymore. They're locked up, they're covered with proteins, they're locked down. Just like if they were radioactive material, they're put in a lead container and you know, put into inside a brick building. So if you, if you lock it up on this earth, what Christ is saying is it will remain so. This is one thing that's going to escape through the fire and everything else that's going to come. What you do to your information system is permanent. 
And therefore, if you let things loose, we're going to find out what happens here as, as we go further. There's consequences. If they've been bound up, there's also consequences, good consequences. But that's what we're talking about here. And when you keep the commandments, and I've already talked about this, we've already talked about keeping the commandments, and what that does is that you use God's circuitry and you are not using the MGE supported circuitry that the devil has. Not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter to the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and your name cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work inequity. Remember I brought this up in the very first lecture, and I said I would deal with it in the very last lecture? I'm making good on my word right now. Remember we discussed that if you were to ask these people, you know, they're there at the wall of the New Jerusalem and they're clamoring, God's made a horrible mistake. Can you please bring Christ out to talk to us? Because we should be in the inside. We have cast out devils in his name. We've done marvelous works. There's clearly been a clerical error. Please bring him out here so we can talk to them. And so while someone goes to get Christ, some of us on the wall will say to them, well, do you think maybe it's because none of you love God? How many of you love God? Every hand goes up. And we say, oh, well, maybe all of you didn't do good works. Oh, no, that's why we're here. All of us here, we all agree we've done good works. Their hand goes up. Well, maybe you didn't ask for forgiveness. Oh, no. We all ask for forgiveness. Remember? And at that point, we left it. And I said we would cover it today. We're covering it today. What does Christ say when he says, I never knew you? That's the key. He says, no, I didn't make a mistake because I never knew you. So that's the reason you're not inside the wall. You're outside the wall. So we need to find out what does this phrase, I never knew you, mean? And we go to the Bible. It's its own expositor. And it says, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He said, that he that said, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So could it be that these people that are on the outside that think they should be on the inside were expecting to have all of their problems with the Ten Commandments taken care of at the second coming, and they weren't taken care of? because they had to have been taken care of earlier. Or they thought they were going to be taken care of when they were resurrected. Hmm, interesting thought. And he said to them, Why call me you me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. If you want, I don't have time. If I could show you all of this, where he makes the clear statement that eternal life is predicated on keeping his commandments, there are dozens of those verses, both in the Old and New Testament. It's just that they're never quoted. And people don't read the Bible, unfortunately, and I say this sadly for themselves. And they're not, many people probably don't even know these texts are there. How do we keep his commandments? Whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. We went over being born of God. We've gone over the word seed, which is sperma, which, of course, is genetic material. And what he's saying is, you've had a rewrite. If you've had a rewrite, no problem. You know him. And it's no small coincidence that throughout the Old and the New Testament, both places, especially in Hosea and the Old, and in the New Testament, Paul talks about it in a number of places, 2 Corinthians being of one of note, is that he, com he compares God 
Christ's relationship to the church as a husband's relationship to the wife. And we remember when we discussed about um, intimacy, marital intimacy, and the amount that that is a special, um, it, that is a, a special, without peer ability for us to communicate information transfer at a genetic level. I'm going to say to you, the reason he uses that as his example is because that's exactly what he has to do for us. He has to rewrite our genome. Now, rewriting our genome is somewhat different. Husband and a wife are exchanging at a horizontal level a lot of direct uh, uh, genome-related informa information directives. But the, the marriage, the, this a, it serves as a very good illustration because God has to communicate, give us information with genetic directives. So, I would, I would suggest to you that the people who are on the outside of the, the, of the city and come to God and say, you've made a mistake, let us in, may have had the, uh, they had the look of being religious, but they lacked, the, they didn't take, uh, uh, they didn't take seriously, nor did they utilize the power that was available for the corrections to be done. And therefore, God's Christ says, I never knew you. We never had an information download. We never had an information sharing. You didn't think you needed it. You thought that you were rich and that you had a beautiful garments and that you were in need of nothing. What happens to those who do not keep his commandments. You are of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. You don't get rid of those mobile genetic elements. Boy, I think we've spent at least three lectures telling you what those things can do to your mind and what they can do to your behavior and what they can do to your thoughts. Probably that's the most important of all the three. And then they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who had caught them and made them obey his will. I've had, I can't tell you the number of times people come up to me and say, well, I've got a very good friend. He's an atheist. And I want to tell you he's the most moral person. He never tells a lie. He doesn't cheat anyone. He goes out of his way to be very... Uh, to be a... Uh, to give and to help others who are in need. And they'll, they'll, he does so much better than the people in your church. That may be true. That may be true. But here's the difference. The people in the church, at least theoretically, are there to get rid of those mobile genetic elements and get a rewrite. And some of them coming in may be very, may be rascals. But they've come to the hospital to get well. Your atheist friend doesn't think he's sick. And for all appearances, when we look at him, we don't see that he's sick. But, oh, there's a little catch here. Who had caught them and made them obey his will? He, he can make them obey his will when he wants to. And so the devil doesn't exercise what he could do with those people all the time. He lets them swim with the rest of the fish and look like they're the, they're the best of the lot. But when he needs to come in and trigger his circuitry, he will. And then you're going to see a completely different person. MGs epitomize information's bits in an inform information universe. We have come full circle. Again, it's information. Remember the Second lecture, right off the bat, we started with information. Remember, we clearly pointed out that science has established that this, this world, this universe, is at its most basic element, information. And that information is put onto either physical matter or energy. It, but it, it, there is no physical matter without information, and there's no energy without information. They're imbued, they're imbued with it. And here we are again. And wouldn't, if someone came in and completely 
hijack the system, they would have to start at the information level or they couldn't really get control of the system. You have to go to the very the first common denominator from which everything else springs and we're right back there again. What will happen to those mobile genetic elements? Surely wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns, it sets the forest thickets ablaze, and that it rolls upward in a column of smoke. By the wrath of the Lord Almighty, the land will be scorched, and the people will be fuel for the fire. No one will spare his brother. God's glory burns foreign information. It destroys it. It vaporizes it. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at each other. Their faces aflame. Mm. I wonder how many of you have heard that text quoted before in a sermon. My bet is no. Not one of you has. Why do the people burn who do not know God? You know what we mean by no, that means information exchange on a big time. Very intimate and very personal and very one-on-one. -on -one. Information theory. What this, uh, what this uh, audiovisual presentation, it introduced you goes back to information and it introduced you to something called Maxwell's demon. Imagine the interplay between the trillions upon trillions of atoms. The amount of bits you would need to describe this is almost unimaginable. But what's amazing is that now, thanks to the ideas of Turing and Shannon, we're able to describe model and simulate nature in ever greater detail. But this isn't the end of the story. Information, it seems, isn't just a way of describing reality. In the last few years, we've discovered that information is actually an inseparable part of the physical world. It's a really difficult idea to get to grips with, but information, everything from a Beethoven symphony to the contents of a dictionary, even a fleeting thought, all information needs to be embodied in some form of physical system. Amazingly, the reason we understand the true connection between information and reality is because of Maxwell's demon. Remember, it seemed like the demon could use information to create order in a box of air that started out completely disordered. Moreover, it could do this without expending any effort. Information seemed to be able to break the laws of physics. Well, that's not true. It can't. The reason why Maxwell's demon can't get energy for free lies here, in his head. What was discovered was this. The demon really is using nothing more than information to create useful energy. But this doesn't mean that he's getting something for nothing. Remember how the demon works. He spots a fast-moving molecule on one side of the box, opens a partition and lets it through to the other side. But each time he does that, he has to store information about that molecule's speed in his memory. Soon, his memory will fill up, and then he can only continue if he starts deleting information. Crucially, this deletion would require him to expend energy. 
the demon needs to keep a record of which molecules are moving where. And if the record keeping device is only finite size, at some point the demon's going to have to erase it. That's an irreversible process that increases the entropy of the universe. It's the erasure of information that increases entropy once and for all. What was discovered is that there's a certain specific minimum amount of energy, known as the Landauer limit, that's required to delete one bit of information. It's tiny, less than a trillion trillionth of the amount of energy in a gram of sugar. But it's real. It's a part of the fundamental fabric of the universe. Amazingly, we can now do real experiments that test aspects of Maxwell's idea. By using lasers and tiny particles of dust, scientists around the world have explored the relationship between information and energy with incredible accuracy. Maxwell's thought experiment, dreamt up in the age of steam, still remains at the cutting edge of scientific research today. Maxwell's demon links together two of the most important concepts in science, the study of energy and the study of information, and shows that the two are profoundly linked. What we now know is that information, far from being some abstract concept, obeys the same laws of physics as everything else in the universe. Information is not just an abstraction, uh, just a mathematical thing or a formula that you write on the paper. It actually, information is carried by something, so it's encoded onto something, a stone, a book, um, a CD, uh, whatever. There's a carrier where the information is on. And that means that information behaves according to the laws of physics, so it cannot break the laws of physics. What humanity has learned over the last few millennia is that information can never be divorced from the physical world. But this is not a hindrance. What makes information so powerful is the fact it can be stored in any physical system we choose. From using stone and clay to allow information to be preserved over eons, to using electricity and light so it can be sent quickly, the medium that stores information gives it unique properties. Today, scientists are exploring new ways of manipulating information, using everything from DNA to quantum particles. They hope that this work will usher in a new information age, every bit as transformative as the last. What we now know is that we're just at the beginning of our journey to unlock the power of information. This is a reminder. We had this in uh, lecture four. Uh, it says that viral abundance ex exhibited in a seasonal fluctuation in the range of 1.7 to 4.0 times 10 to the seventh. In other words, 1.7 million to 40 million viruses in every millimeter of air that you breathe, depending on whether it's in the fall or the spring. If it's in the spring, you have 40 million per milliliter. And if it's the fall, you have a mere um, 1,700. I mean 1,700,000, sorry. In each milliliter of air, how much information do you think is there? A whole lot. That's one milliliter of air. Oh, but let's look on. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's the worst of it. No, there's an estimated 10 to the 30 viruses in the ocean alone. And they have multiple nucleotide base pairs. Oh dear, let's see, 2 times 10 to the 11th times 1 
times 10 to the 30th. Oh, if it was stretched end to end, it would span, span further than the nearest 60 galaxies. The closest galaxy we have is 2 million light years. So let's say there are every 2 million light years thereafter, which they're not. There are some that are further. That's a mere 120 million light years just for the viruses, which are only part of the mobile genetic elements. We're only talking about one part of the mobile genetic elements. And now are you beginning to get an idea of massive energy explosion possible if you were to erase all of this information? And the other thing I want you to pick up is I've talked about air and water. It's everywhere. This world is riddled with mobile genetic elements. There is nowhere you can go to get away from them. They are there by the millions and billions. Every milliliter of water has 10 million viruses. I, we could go on and on with these numbers. They soon become very meaningless, except to point out that there is no part of our world that isn't entirely saturated with mobile genetic elements in one form or another, whether it's inside of our genome and it has to do with signs and lines and ALUs and of those nature, or if it's outside dealing with viruses, or if it's um, any one of the other mobile, uh, mobile genetic elephant entities that we've talked about. They are everywhere. They permeate everything. There is nothing that hasn't been contaminated. Notice that under abundance, do you notice, look at the viruses. It's talking about viruses are by far the most abundant biological entities in the oceans, comprising approximately 94% of the nucleic acid containing particles. Now those particles, multiply that times 2 times 10 to the 11th. We're talking staggering amounts of information which we have Bible already tells us God's presence is going to vaporize. Now let's just look up viruses for a minute. It says here we briefly introduce our viral planet and then address a major under outstanding question in biology. Why is most of life viral? Now on this paper they think viruses are examples of living protoplasm. I do not. I think viruses are, and they're going to actually, in my opinion, contradict themselves later in this article, and I'm going to show you that viruses are nothing but pure information. They're pure information. They say it. So, to me, if you're pure information, that doesn't, that, without a cell, that viruses can never replicate, it cannot, cannot do anything, it lays dormant. But a cell, once it gets going, it can make daughter cells, and they can make further daughter cells, you see. And that, to me, is a major difference why one's living and one's not. One of them can very actively interact with its environment in such a way as to actually change it, where the viruses simply come into their environment and change their environment into themselves. That's, and there's a difference there, and let's just leave it for now. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, a key insight is that during an infection cycle, the original virus is completely broken down and only the associated information, there we go again, is passed on to the next generation. This is different for cellular organisms, which must pass on some physical part of themselves from one generation or from generation to generation. Viruses are the only biological entities that replicate purely as information. Here we keep coming up with that word again every time we turn around. Not one single molecule, atom, or quark must be transferred between the old and the new. The only thing that must be moved between viral generations is the information to build the next set of viruses. The rest of biology operates differently. And that's, they probably said it a little more eloquently than I did, that the difference between a living and a non-living is that the living passes on materials of itself. It's not pure information. Viruses are particularly easy to overlook because they are completely outside our sensory range. This is a problem because by missing the virosphere, biologists have 
effectively ignored the most abundant and diverse biological entities on Earth. Conservatively, there are 1.0 times 10 to the 31 of them. Now, depending on where you read and where you look, because it's, it's, it's changing all the time, uh, I read a, a while ago, and it may be different now, so I'm not, uh, I'm saying please verify this, but, that they estimate that there are 1 times 10 to the 28th stars in the known CN and the universe that we can see. 1 times 10 to the 28th stars. Well, there's three magnitudes higher. Remember, exponentially, you're talking a vast amount more of viruses that are, and we're going to find out, that are replicated each week. Our best estimates are that every week, 10 to the 31st viruses fall apart and 10 to the 31st new ones are made to replace them. This means that roughly 1 times 1.7 times 10 to the 25th new viruses are produced every second. Now stop and remember, remember the tattoo. The tattoo analogy. Look how much energy those viruses are taking out of the system. They don't bring any energy in with them. Remember, they only bring in information. Look how much energy they are sapping out of that, out of the, our biosphere, our, our biome, to make more of themselves. It's a huge in energy drain on everything in this biome, everything that's living. Thus, each second, uh, more than 10 to the 30 base pairs of viral DNA are made on planet Earth. More than all the stars in the known universe. Every second. We are talking a whole lot of information. The point of these exercises is to show how numerous, massive, and dynamic these 10 to the 31st viruses really are. When considering the virus sphere, extremely unlikely events become probabilistic certainties. Because viruses are incredibly abundant, much more so than microbes, and because the majority of the information contained in the viral genomes are, is unknown, viruses are the final frontier of the unexplored genetic diversity, and we are the largest, and are the largest repository that exists, we are left with the question, why are there so many viruses? We suggest that genetic information is the set of instructions to construct the scaffold of Maxwell's demons, and the scaffold would be the two boxes, such that they convert different types of physical information into more instances of themselves. This new information has a thermodynamic cost when it is erased, and the amount of heat released by the destruction of information is also described by Landauer's principle. Remember, I told you a little bit about that. We hypothesize that this step is viral because it is done at great thermodynamic insufficiency. I'm going to start with a sentence right before that. Ultimately, the community is converting physical information into genetic information. This is the viral community. We hypothesize that this step is viral because it is done at a great thermodynamic inefficiency. That is, a lot of waste heat is produced. Using the rule of thumb that each trophic transfer loses 90% of the heat, each joule of viral information gained costs the system 100 joules of physical information. Remember I told you to erase it, it's very inefficient, it's about 90% heat, 10% goes to the erasure. Well, the same is true when the virus comes in, commandeers the cell, and forces it to make more viruses. So we've got an absolute energy sink in two main areas with this rogue information that's entered the system. First of all, it replicates itself and uses the system to provide the energy to do so, and it, a vast amount of energy is wasted, not only because you're making viruses which are going to cause more energy drag, but because it's inefficient and a lot of the energy used to construct the virus goes out as heat. Is there any evidence that viral information is real? Geminale and colleagues used isothermal calimetry to study the heat released by marine, microbial, and viral communities. In this experiment, viruses 
lowered the standing stock of the cellular component by about 25%. At the same time, viruses increased the work output of the system by over 200%. The decline in cell numbers coupled with the increase in diversity looks very much like viral information. What are they saying here? If you have a, 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 a beaker and it's got some bacteria that are floating around enjoying life in this beaker in water and you introduce a bacteriophage which is going to go in and infect those bacteria what happens is if you watch it comes to a steady state eventually and you have 25 percent fewer of those microbes in the beaker than you did before you put the virus in but if you measure the amount of work that's being done by the 75 percent that remain it is tw it's 200 percent more just to stay alive and fiend off the viruses from killing the whole lot. These mobile genetic elements have, are, are, are wreaking havoc with our biome, not just us, but with everything around us. Envisioning the biosphere as a massive system that ultimately feeds viruses helps us address a major outstanding question. Why is biological diversity dominated by viruses? This question would not, have been, would not have even occurred to earlier biologists simply because they did not know the extent of the virosphere. If you want to look at the number one, 94% of any of the information system we have, whether it's DNA, RNA, messenger, whatever, it's viral. The other 6% is divided between all the other living things on the planet. The mysterious unfoldome, structuralist, unappreciated, yet vital parts of any proteome. Proteome is all the proteins that we have in our body. Mobile genetic elements are rogue information that have come in. They're pirate information, and they are not part of the system. And when exposed to God's presence, at least I'm presenting the hypothesis, they are vaporized and they are sent back to energy. But there's more problems than just the DNA or just the, the, the information system that, that we have to worry about. The, there are proteins that are called intrinsically disordered proteins. And guess what is the main, guess where they come from? They come from mobile genetic elements that have settled into protein coding areas of your, our DNA and make these new proteins that can change form with any type of environment they're in. And they're very unstable. And as I'm going to read here, it says, since um, intrinsically disordered proteins constitute a significant portion of any given protein, proteome, they can combine in an unfoldome, which means the way they unfold, the way proteins fold together depends upon their action. And sometimes these proteins fold up one way, and then if the environment changes, they change, they unfold, and they'll fold up, fold up in a new way. And it says amino acid sequences and compositions of these IDPs are very different from those of ordered proteins. Yeah, they're mobile genetically hijacked, making possible reliable identification of IDPs at the proteome level by various computational means. And up earlier it says that they are associated with various human diseases. That should be no surprise. As many of the proteins associated with conformational diseases are also involved in recognition, regulation, and cell signaling, it has been hypothesized that many of them are IDPs. The whole system has been riddled with these mobile genetic elements hijacking the proteins that come out so that they're grossly ineffective. And I'm going to postulate to you, since proteins are a form of information, that these proteins with these intrinsically disordered proteins are going to be vaporized by the same glory that vaporizes the mobile genetic elements because they're the children of the mobile genetic elements. And we're talking information, remember, whether the pro what's in the proteins or whether it's in the DNA, it's still information. So now add proteins to all of the uh, mobile genetic element information that we've got in our biome. I, even I am he that blots out your transgressions. And I used, growing up, I thought, well, God forgives our sins because he feels so sorry for us, and that's really why he does it. But I am, I, I, for those of you who, he does feel sorry for us. And that is one of the reasons he does it. But it's not the main reason that he does it. 
He says here in Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I am he that blots out your transgressions for my own sake. He's got to get rid of this energy sucking cancer. If he doesn't put it into it, it would stop. It would not stop. It would take, it could grow and grow until it's taking God's, the energy that God's pumping into the system would become absolutely absurdly high for him to sustain. And all that energy is going to be made more information, which will yet suck out more. It's an unstoppable train get a runaway freight train unless God puts a stop to it and says we're eliminating it. I will not have this in my creation. It's wrecking it. It's wreaking havoc. It is plundering it. It is pirates. It's raping it. It is scorched earth policy. I won't have it. I can't have it. It's not sustainable. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. The same rules that go for energy, which says energy is conserved in the universe, it's not gained or lost, is also true for information. It's a fascinating argument which occurred between Professor Suskind, at, uh, emeritus professor at Stanford, and... Um, um, the guy who wrote the brief history Hawking. of time, Hawking, Stephen Hawking, about whether information could be destroyed at a black hole, at a rim of a black hole, and Susskind won because information is preserved at the round, the rim of the black hole. So it too, because information rides on energy and matter, and matter is nothing more than capsulized energy, you can see they all three are interchangeable. So what could be this strange act? And I'm going to suggest to you that the strange act is God says, I'm going to erase information. I'm going to erase information. And it will be erased forever. And it's never coming back. That's why he uses terms to us like, I will hide your sins in the depth of the ocean. It's not that the actions we did, it's the code that caused the actions. That's the malignant part. Your actions are done and gone. We can't go back and change them. It's the code that got you to make the actions in the first place. That's what's got to be from removed and forever destroyed. It's malignant. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fear, fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Remember this devouring fire is God's glory. We, we, I've spent quite a bit of time already. Remember 1 Timothy 6, 16, which the light which no man can approach to. Who among us can dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? Behold, they shall be a stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm it, nor a fire to sit by it. What is Isaiah saying here in Isaiah 47? He's saying this fire is different from any fire that humanity knows about. This is a fire. This is a, a, an information, I mean, a, a, a energy release like nothing we've ever seen. We have nothing to compare it to. It is in a class by itself. And if you want to talk about magnitude, it is off the charts. We can't even begin to conceptualize it. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and comp encompassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven to, and, and devoured them. What did we talk about just earlier? This fire, the everlasting burnings, and the, we've connected them with the Bible. It's God's glory. And we don't ever want that fire to go out because if it did, there'd be no universe. This is the energy engine that keeps everything working. We don't ever want it to burn out. That's if you are in complete compatibility with it. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Death and hell, hell is Hades where the dead live. And death is being cast into the fire. What causes death? We've gone through this, haven't we? I hope we've, drum, we've beat this drum 
Dr. Webster and I incessantly, almost to the point of redundancy, it's mobile genetic elements. If they weren't around, there wouldn't be any death. So when it says here death is thrown into this fire, you can replace mobile genetic elements because they're the ones that do it. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the book of fire. Oh, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Hmm. Well, what can they mean by that? If I am actively using mobile genetic elements in the circuitry of my daily living, it is part of me. I have chosen to keep them, even in the face of being told that I should relinquish them, work with God to get them erased. Erased in a controlled manner over a longer period of time. A small amount of energy left out over a long period of time can get a lot of this stuff erased. Does that sound like sanctification, maybe? And if, if I choose to keep it, it's part of me. God's going to say, okay, if you've chosen to keep it, I'm not going to remove that from you. You have free will and free choice. I will leave that code. You're using it. It's you. If you're using it, it's part of you. It's not in the heterochromatin out there locked up. You're actively using it every day. And so when he comes to destroy these mobile genetic elements, if they're embedded in my DNA and I'm using them, they're not safely ensconced elsewhere where they can be eliminated, what's going to happen to me when they are destroyed? I'm going to be destroyed because I'm holding on to them. And anything that has them is going to be destroyed with them. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in a holy conversation and godliness? Paul's, I mean, Peter's saying, hey, lay, the, the, we're talking major problem here. When this stuff is if, if taken away, you want to get rid of it now. Why God, if Christ has made the plan of salvation and sanctification. This is serious. Looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of God. We're in the heavens being on fire. The air is going to be on fire. Well, we already talked about it, didn't we? There's up to 40, 44 million virons in every milliliter of air. Is that any surprise that the air is going to combust? And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Everything is going... This is a meltdown. This world is going to melt down. And there's some tests that suggest that it's going to melt away. The heat is going to be so... Tremendous. Will all be saved then? No, because they will not acknowledge sin nor the life of God in them. It is true that he bears all sin, but if we persist in bearing it as well, we're still using it, either by refusing to acknowledge that it is sin or by refusing to believe that he bears it, then it necessarily follows that in the final extinction of all sin, we must go out of existence also. The sacrifice has been made, and it is ample because it is the life that bears all things. Therefore, all men might as well be saved as not. God has said, I will take care of these mobile genetic elements. I was responsible for creating you, Lucifer, so the buck stops here since he made them. I'm going to be responsible for removing them. But if we say, uh, uh, there's some of them we still like using, he's going to say, have at it. But know what's going to happen to them. But see, notice in the statement, denying that they exist. Go read 1 John 1 sometime that you're a liar if you say you, you're not, that you do not have any sin in you. 
for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. It's been very interesting. I've heard many a preacher, when he, uh, well, not many, a few have tackled this. I, I, let me rephrase that. I have seen a few pastors have enough gumption to tackle this text. And they go through intellectual gymnastics uh, with such effort worthy, worthy of a better cause to try to make, to show you that when you break one, you break all ten. And I've got to tell you, bless their hearts, they've tried, but they are far from convincing. That doesn't work. Because I can provide them with the illustration uh, where you would only be breaking one or two. So what is it referring to? Ah, but if we go to information theory, it's very simple. Remember, if you leave one nidus of mobile genetic elements, what do they do? If you're using them, they multiply and they jump to other chromosomes. And before you know it, if you haven't eradicated them, they've reestablished themselves throughout your entire information system. So either what, this is, what James is saying here is either you get rid of all of it or you haven't gotten rid of it at all. When he comes a second time, why doesn't Christ's glory cause a second death of the wickedness? Uh, we're short of time. I'll just say this much. Remember, when Christ comes a second time, he remains way out there somewhere in the sky. He never touches the earth. He doesn't get close enough. And fire from heaven does not come down. And that fire from heaven that we talked about earlier coming down is God finally saying, okay, we're going back to the way things originally were. I'm going to let my glory go everywhere. Because it sustains everything and I'm not going to deprive those that are in complete uh, sympathy with me from the en en energy and the beneficial effects of my glory. And if you aren't one of those, I'm sorry. You've been given ample time, you've been given ample resources, and you have chosen to remain where you are. You will then have to reap the consequence. Sin pays its wage death, Romans 6.23. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness and expose the motives of men's hearts. There's another reason why that the full sentence is not executed at that point, and that is because there will be a one final gathering of all humanity where everything will be shown from the very inception of sin in heaven with Lucifer until that moment in time to show you clearly that God has had nothing to do with the, uh, in, in any way for being the causative agent for sin to be here. If God's glory will define who is lost and who is saved, why does Daniel talk of a judgment when the books are open? Remember Daniel 7, and I beheld thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow. And it goes on and it says there was thousands ministered before him and 10,000 times 10,000, the judgment was set and the books were open. The Adventist persuasion, we say that's the investigative judgment, and I've heard a lot of snickering and denergation of this concept. They say if God knows every one of the, count of the hairs on your head, he certainly knows where you stand in relationship to him. That's a true statement. I'm not going to argue that. But they're missing a very important difference. Did you notice that there's 10,000 times 10,000? That's the Hebrew way of saying that's the highest number we have, and it's beyond that, so it's innumerable. I'm going to suggest to you that the representatives from all the other intelligent orders that he has created have a vested interest to know how God completes this problem down here because they, like we, the only thing that all of us share in common is the only thing we own is our information system. Remember we talked about being a created being ha means you have an information system. That's one of the assumptions that we made in, this, um, in the uh, genome philosophy. So if that's the case... They want to know that God has not played footsies with the information system of you and me. That it has been guarded pristine and carefully and that you and I made all the decisions in the end that, imp that determine where we end up. And that God in no way unduly influenced one way or the other by manipulating, playing with, or otherwise monkeying with our information system. That's of vital importance and they have to know that for everyone that comes up. And only then, when God has gone through every case and showed why some were able, he was able 
to eradicate the mobile genetic elements and keep them, them and others. He was not able to eradicate all the mobile genetic elements and still keep them who they were because they were actively using circuitry that employed those mobile genetic elements. Only when he has demonstrated that in every case will this be put to bed. And God is not going to leave anything unturned. When we're done with sin, we're done. This is vitally important for a whole system that's built on information is to make sure that God has not played unfair with that information. It is vital. You cannot have peace for eternity until each one of these things has been clearly demonstrated that God in no way abused his power in any shape, way, or form when it came to preserving the information of you and me. So yes, there is an investigative judgment. There has to be one. But the assumptions that we've always taken in aren't, I would suggest to you, what's going on at all. Something far more important. And no, these other beings aren't there up there gathering trying to say, oh boy, what, what type of salacious event, activity have they been up to? I'm, I'm going to suggest to you it has all to do with information and it has to look, do with looking at code. And who writes this code? Well, in this, this article written in your blood, born into a working class family, Olivia was abused as a child. Her parents were emotionally distant and offered her little comfort. Now, age 56, Olivia lives near a busy road. She is poor, smokes, drinks much more than is good for her, and has panic attacks. If Olivia really existed, she probably wouldn't want many people to know all these details about her life, but a tiny drop of her blood could give it all away. The technology now exists to read in our blood all the kinds of information described above and more. Such tests could tell others much about our health and habits state of mind, and socioeconomic status. It could also reveal the details from bygone decades, such as experiences from the furthest recesses of our childhood. But let's go on. Subtle traces on your DNA can reveal what's happened to you during your lifetime. Although the vast majority of studies have focused on negative life experiences, such as childhood abuse, this kind of testing doesn't have to be all doom and gloom. Positive experience alter our epigenome as well. Positive events can change you every bit as much as negative ones, says Rachel Yehuda, a clinical neuroscientist at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Biology doesn't discriminate between the two. When the books are opened, guess who the books are? They're you and me. We are the record keepers. The books in heaven, if they're anything, they're just a copy of what we've got going on in our information system. Our information system records everything. It records all of our choices. It has everything right there. We cannot come up to God in the end and say, you didn't write things down right. You, There was a glitch in the way you kept the information, God, because if you'd have kept the information, I'd be on the inside. I wouldn't be on the outside. And God says, no, you were the... You were the keeper of your own information this whole time. If there's been any mischief, it's been you that's done it. Because no, you're the only one that's had access to it. In the end, there is going to be no, no charge that can be leveled against God at any, at any point of this salvation scenario that's cost him so much where you're going to say, where he goes, oh, you got a point there. Where the book? The books are open up there are just revealing what that person has recorded themselves. You write that book that's opened up there. You wrote it. So whatever is in it, you're responsible for it. What need could there be for an investigative judgment if God's glory will divide the sheep from the goats? I've already talked about this. So it really boils down to the investigative judgment. Christ says, I can't save John Doe. Why? He's still using mobile genetic elements. They're part of him. He is clinging to them, and I will not remove him due to free will. And therefore, he is going to perish with his idols. 
Jane Doe, on the other hand, came to me and said, do whatever it takes, I'm going to remain under. And we were able to rewrite her entire information system. We were able to segregate the mobile genetic elements where we could do a controlled burn. And therefore, I can keep her who she is because she renounced all this mobile genetic element behavior. So she gets to come in. And all those numberless intelligent beings out there will go, okay, God, we see that. You're absolutely right. Next. Remember, I, heterochromatin, I'm just showing you again, that's mobile genetic elements, which have been bound up into these protein, um, if you will, and, and, and speaking as an analogy, concrete containers where they can't be bothered or utilized. But he that does wrong shall receive the wrong which he has done, and there is no respecter of persons. So there's none of this, oh, I know God's going to let Uncle Henry, and he's such a, he's such a good guy, he's so funny, and he gave so much, he helped so many people, and yes, he did have some problems, but over and all, God's going to like him. He's really a good guy. It has nothing to do with God liking. God likes all of us. It has nothing to do with loving. God loves all of us. He would like all of us to be there. But if we don't cooperate with him, we all won't. And that's the issue. Not whether he likes us, it's whether we've, co co whether we've cooperated with him. Why God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and the things in heaven and the things on earth and things under the earth, and every tongue will confess that God is Lord. What this is talking about is at the very end when the final... Everything is revealed in the big scenario. All the books are open and we're told everything from beginning to end. At the end of it, every, cre every intelligent being in the universe is just not just restricted to human beings. Lucifer is going to be in, in this group. Every, cre every intelligent created being in the God's entire universe at one time gets on their knees and says, God, you had nothing to do with this. You did everything you could to stop it. You did everything you could to correct it. And you never broke any of the rules you asked us to keep. You are innocent of any wrongdoing in all of this. And if we're not inside the city, it's our fault. It's not your fault. It's ours. And if you stop and think about that, the only way they're ever going to do that, because there's going to be a lot of people out there that don't like God, there's gnashing of teeth, you know. It's if the evidence is overwhelming, and there's no crack in the evidence anywhere. And it doesn't count if God comes in and with his strong arm says, you're going to kneel because I said so. Because you know what? They might be kneeling, but with their fists, they're going to be doing this. And the Bible would have said that. Instead, they all are like this. Nobody's got a fist in the air. No one is making an accusation. Everyone has said, you are blameless. We're the problem. If they're not in there. And everyone else who is in the city and all the other intelligent beings, they bow to and they say, we exonerate you, God. You have, the devil's accusation against you have all been proven to be false. They are meritless. They have no evidence behind them. Which gets us to the last slide of our journey and the last, the, the very last end point. And I'm going to give you a very quick little analogy. My wife and I used to go to New York City a lot. And one of my favorite things to do, I, I bet I've been there 50, 60, 70 times, maybe even 100, I don't know. Was I would try to go up the Upper East Side to the uh, college, I mean to the uh, Museum of Art and History at 82nd on the Upper East Side. And it starts from the very earliest of Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham was, and it follows it all the way to present time. All the paintings and all the culture that they could have put in this huge building, and I don't know how many city blocks it covers, but it's huge. And they have their Egypt, Egyptology room, it's, uh, rooms it's themselves are the size of most museums. If I were to go there and all of this priceless history of humanity, if I were to walk in there, with a sledgehammer and I started to destroy the artifacts, what would happen? Would they say, oh, he's there, there he is. 
He's got some anger issues. Just leave him alone. Let him finish. Don't, don't reprimand him. Don't reprimand him. Just leave him alone. Or would they tackle me, tie me up, and get me out of there? Einstein, in 1915, after he came out with the general theory of relativity, he from then on pretty much took his time to try to find what was called a grand unifying theory. That's a theory of everything. That's a theory from which all other equations and theorems would spring from. He never found it, and they're still looking for it today, and they haven't found it. But in religion, I'm going to suggest to you, in, in our dealing with God, there is a grand unifying theory that will explain everything and all of the rules, the Ten Commandments, all the other thermodynamic rules, whether they be physics, which we relegate artificially to the physical world, or whether we relegate to the religious world. There is one basic grand unifying theory from which all the other rules spring and it's simply this. God says to you and me, I have a wonderful offer for you. You can go with me on a trip that never ends. I have wonderful things that I'm going to create and show you things that you cannot imagine as far as their complexity, their beauty, and the awe-inspiring results that it's going to generate in you. But there's only one provision only one that you must follow. And that's this. Don't destroy anything I make. Don't destroy anything I make. Is he being unreasonable? No. The rules he sets in place, abide by them. Don't destroy them. Don't break them. The limits that he's put are there for our safety. Follow them. That's the only requirement. Don't destroy anything I make. We follow those rules down here. I just gave you the example of going up to the museum. We wouldn't tolerate it. Why should he? It's so simple. He has made a way for all of us to get out of this horrible mess that we were put into by not uh, by any request of our own. He's taken it upon himself. He's carried the load. He's lifted the weight. All we have to do is cooperate with him. That's all. And to me, that's cheap enough. 